My plan, the Freedom Dividend, would pay every American adult starting at age 18 $1,000 a month or $12,000 a year. This would push every American adult to just below the poverty line, which is $12,770 a year right now. But this money would get spent in Main Street businesses on car repairs, food and tutoring for your kids, the occasional night out, a hardware store. It would go right back into our economy and would create 2 million new jobs, would grow the consumer economy by 8 to 10 percent, would make our families and communities stronger, would in improve children's health and nutrition, would improve everyone's mental health and productivity, it would decrease domestic violence uh, and hospital visits. So universal basic income is a, a powerful policy that helps improve human welfare, and that's uh, why I'm proposing the it. The Labor Department is out with jaw-dropping new numbers. Unemployment claims skyrocketing with 6.6 .6 million people filing in the last week alone. It's still 1.5 million. It's still an enormous number. One Wall Street is set to open up higher. The Nasdaq set a record and passed the 10,000 mark. What a tear stocks have been on. There's a huge disconnect. You got 30 million people out of work in the stock market, and the Nasdaq is at record highs. Okay. Together, we built the greatest economy in history, and now we have to bring it back. We still have a lot of hardship, but it looks like we've hit a turning point. More than 30% of Americans have not made their full housing payments for July, including 19% who made no housing payments at all. A nation in crisis and rapidly reaching an economic turning point. Americans started this year working. Our unemployment rate was at a 50-year low. Yet somewhere between half and three quarters of all Americans were living paycheck to paycheck. And that was before the pandemic, before the country shut down and put tens of millions of people out of work. If you lose your job in a city in this country, uh, it's probably as or more likely that the reason you're losing your job is not globalization, but it's technology enabled disruption. Okay, it's, things are, it's changing. People are attributing it to globalization, but it's probably as or more likely to be due to the fact that businesses are increasingly replacing workers with technology. Whole industries are being disrupted. Hello everyone, I'm a sorting robot. I know I look cute, but my skills are a lot more impressive. I can identify the information on each of the parcels effectively and sort them out precisely. My friends and I can process as many as 18,000 parcels in an hour. Why should we be worried about automation? Well, if you look at the backdrop, we automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, and those communities have never recovered. Where if you look at the numbers, half of the workers left the workforce and never worked again, and then half of that group filed for disability. Now, what happened to the manufacturing workers is now going to happen to the truck drivers, retail workers, call centers, fast food workers, and on and on through the economy as we evolve and technology marginalizes the labor of more and more Americans. I think it's going to be disastrous, where if you look at truck drivers alone, being a trucker is the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truck drivers in this country. Uh, and my friends in Silicon Valley are working on trucks that can drive themselves because that's where the money is, where we can save tens, even hundreds of billions of dollars by trying to automate that job. Uh, workers are far more likely today to lose their jobs or have their functions changed because of technology-enabled disruption. Technology is replacing people. And in addition, because of technology-enabled disruption, consumers have much more uh, pricing power. They have the ability to shop with technology. That's putting much more pressure on businesses in terms of pricing pressure and businesses don't have as much pricing power and that probably is rippling back through impacts on workers and their wages uh, and may be encouraging businesses to increasingly replace workers with technology. The future is already here and work and jobs in America have already come apart. When the coronavirus hit the U.S. economy, it came fast and furious. There's the circuit breaker, uh, oh, 2549, 48, and, and the bell. The nation went into a panic, stocking up and shocking our supply chain. As millions began working and teaching from home, our skies and airports emptied out. Normal life canceled as millions of businesses, big and small, closed, pushing us into the worst global recession in history. Roughly 50 million unemployment claims filed in the span of just four months.
work. I mean, of all the jobs, nearly all the jobs that we've created in the past decade have been part-time, contingent, or temporary. These kinds of very unstable, lumpy, uh, jobs with lumpy income cycles. And a guaranteed income of $500 a month would be a powerful force to stabilize the lives of people who, who need it the most. In some ways, it's a down payment. If the robots do indeed rise and self-driving cars are on the roads in five years, as some technologists predict, then it'll be much easier to build on a foundation of a guaranteed income of something like $500 a month than to begin afresh. So my view is that the idea of a guaranteed income is to solve the problems of today and in a way that it could be implemented immediately. Little bits can save lives and make futures for the children of this world at unbelievably low cost. And it just uh, gets me that we have $10 trillion here and we have kids who are hungry, dying, and out of school over here. It's mind-boggling. Mind-boggling to think of Jeff Bezos, for example, with a net worth personally, individual net worth of, hold on to your chair, how about $163 billion? That's, that's a lot of money. It's, uh, I'm, I'm myself a, an Amazon user. Uh, I think it's a awfully a good uh, uh, service and product that he's developed. But $163 billion in a world where a lot of his workers struggle to get by. A lot of the people in Seattle where uh, Amazon is headquartered are homeless, where there are incredible needs that for a tiny fraction of that wealth could keep millions of kids alive and in school. You have to say, all right, world economy is dynamic, but it's not really exactly fair and it's not really oriented towards uh, addressing everyone's uh, basic human rights and needs. And can't we make the connection? And the answer is we have to. So the way I propose to pay for a universal basic income uh, is based on a problem we have right now in our country, which is that more and more work and value is getting sucked up and soaked up by a handful of technology companies. Uh, Amazon, for example, is doing another $20 billion in commerce every year, and it's now pushing 30% of American malls and Main Street stores into closing. And so for the average uh, American, you're seeing your Main Street stores close, and unfortunately, being a retail worker is the most common job in the United States. The average retail worker is a 39-year-old woman making between $11 and $12 an hour. So the problem America is facing is that even as, as Amazon is soaking up more and more value, they're not paying much in the way of taxes. You probably saw the headline where last year Amazon enjoyed record profits and paid zero in federal taxes. And so the way we pay for a universal basic income is we put the American people in position to benefit from all this innovation by passing a value-added tax, which is something that's already in effect in every other advanced economy. With a value-added tax, the American public would receive a sliver of every Amazon sale, every Google search, every Facebook ad, every robot truck mile. And because our economy is now so vast at $20 trillion, up $5 trillion in the last 12 years alone, a value-added tax at even half the European level would generate $800 billion in revenue, which combined with current spending, economic growth from putting this buying power into Americans' hands, cost savings on things like incarceration, homelessness services, and emergency room health care, and then the value gains from having a stronger, more educated, more productive, more entrepreneurial population. There's one study that showed that if you were to reduce, uh, reduce poverty in this country, you would actually be increasing GDP by $700 billion just by making people stronger, healthier, better educated, and uh, mentally healthier. And so we're going to be able to pay for this universal basic income if we put in a new tax that harnesses the gains of all these new technological innovations and brings them back to the American people. When the rubber meets the road, there are really big questions about who pays for this. And um, there's, I'm sure, lots of skepticism that tax rates should go up. I think ultimately, though, the, the, the case can be made 
that this is not just a moral issue, that everybody should have basic financial stability, but also a practical one. And if we really want the economy to continue to grow and not face the kind of depression, which happened right after 1929, the year that inequality was last as bad as it is now, then we're going to have to think about creative ideas that break through 